We may finally know how magic mushrooms work to relieve depression. It's a great image. This is from sciencealert.com. For many people with treatment-resistant depression, in recent years, hope has been offered by psychedelics such as psilocybin, the key active ingredient in magic mushrooms. Actually, the active ingredient is psilocin. Psilocybin gets converted to psilocin during the process of consuming it. So it's not the active ingredient, but, you know, whatever. I'm nitpicking. It appears that psychedelics may flip the switch on rigid brain networks, but we haven't been entirely sure how that works. Now, new brain mapping research from a leading group of psychedelics researchers deepens our understanding of how psilocybin works in the brain. First, dissolving and then expanding brain connections. Certain parts of depressed people's brain become more interconnected and flexible after two doses of psilocybin. And these changes lasted up to three weeks after treatment, the study found. These findings are important, says neuro, oh my god, neuropsychopharmacologist, wow, what a word, David Nutt of the Imperial College London, ICL. For the first time, we find that psilocybin works differently from conventional antidepressants, making the brain more flexible and fluid and less entrenched in negative thinking patterns associated with depression. Uh, so basically, let me boil this down for you. Um, depression and anxiety is essentially, it's a hyper-connected uh, part of your brain that will cycle on negative things, right? So the more you think about negativity, it's a feedback effect. You think about it, oh, this thing is really stressing me out, oh, it's stressing me out. And then, like, it creates, like, it's kind of like, imagine, like, when you're walking through, a, like, uh, the forest. And if so many people over the course of years and years walk through the forest, it creates a trail, Right? That's kind of what we're talking about in the brain, right? So when you become, when you have an anxiety disorder, what you do is every time you, you ruminate on certain things, it deepens the connections that make it so that, you know, it's easier to fall into that trail. It's like, you, you know, so, that's, so the idea of mushrooms is what they do is they kind of just fuck around with all of your connections. They go like, whoa, like your brain starts talking to other parts of the brain. All of a sudden, you're not entrenched in the, fa in the same thought patterns and thought, you know, loops of anxiety. Right, and you're able to maybe deepen the connections between other parts in your brain, and eventually the trail that was once there will eventually, you know, plants will grow out of it, and then the trail will be gone. That's the idea. Uh, anyway, let's keep reading. Many indigenous people have long used magic mushrooms and other plants for their healing and hallucinogenic properties. It, in only the last two decades or so has there been a cautious resurgence in clinical research fronted by researchers behind the latest study to understand whether psilocybin may help to alleviate depression and anxiety and how psychedelic drugs affect the brain more generally. Just last year, a small landmark trial from Nutt and colleagues showed psilocybin coupled with psychological therapy was at least as effective as taking a common antidepressant. Escitalopram, a drug that often comes with impactful side effects such as weight gain, lack of libido, and insomnia. I will tell you this. You do not and will not have any libido problems when you're doing mushrooms. Let me tell you that much. In a 2018 brain imaging study of 20 people with depressive symptoms, psilocybin also appeared to enhance people's emotional response rather than blunting it like antidepressants tend to do. But observing positive benefits among small groups of people is one thing. Untangling what's happening in the brain is another challenge altogether. And so far, the mechanisms of how psilocybin works in the brain have remained poorly understood. Analyzing brain scans of nearly 60 people with clinical depression involved in two previous trials, Nutt and colleagues found that receiving, a psilocy receiving psilocybin had greater connectivity between brain regions that are rich in serotonin receptors and usually segregated in depressed patients. The effect was rapid, sustained, and strongest in people who reported the depressive symptoms had eased. Their brain networks were more interconnected and flexible one day after treatment and in some people three weeks later. So uh, for those of you that are wondering about dosing, uh, the study is here. It lists all the dosing uh, and all that kind of stuff. I might read the full study later. Um, but, uh, you know, just wanted to throw that out there. Uh, but anyway, uh, yes, I agree with this. I have done experimentation on myself with mushrooms as as 
a depressed person. <laughs> I'm so depressed. And anxious. I have an anxiety disorder. I'm anxious as hell. In fact, I'm freaking out right now. Whoa. Um, I've done a lot of experimentation on myself. And uh, pretty much... Um, pretty much everything uh, that this is saying I can attest to. Um, for me, oftentimes when I would have uh, a bad trip, as it were, uh, it usually is revolving around my anxieties. Sometimes I have a lot of anxieties that pile up. And um, sometimes when I'm having a mushroom experience, my anxieties will come flooding out. And then all of a sudden, I'm ruminating about these anxieties. And then I realize, wait a second, I don't need to be anxious about that. And then boom, I'm happy. I'm super happy. And then I'm happy for weeks and weeks and weeks. Um, typically, you know, and sometimes, you know, the anxieties happen again. They come back sometimes, right? So again, maybe if I continue to do self-experimentation, I'll either go crazy. It's possible, unlikely, but possible, or Maybe I will be completely cured of anxiety if I continue to experiment on myself. It's possible. Who knows? Uh, but uh, anyway, this study in these studies, I can attest to that with my personal experience. Um, oftentimes, anxiety is just like, you know, um, it's like, you know, it's just like something you're used to. It's like a habit. Um, You know, it's like, you know, biting your fingernails or, you know, pulling your hair or, you know, something like that. It's like a habit, but in your brain, in the subconscious and in, in the conscious level. But a lot of the times anxiety is subconscious. So you don't really notice it until like, you know, you're in the middle of these thought pro uh, patterns that are really unhelpful and really, you know, annoying to deal with. Uh, having to constantly ruminate over every bad thing that's going on or could happen or what if this happened or what if I did this and then several years later then the world explodes, right? So what it does is it hyperconnects your brain uh, in a way that allows you to get more context in solving your problems, right? You can just, oh, maybe I'm having anxiety over a problem I need to solve, but maybe the anxiety doesn't help. Right. There's helpful anxiety and there's unhelpful anxiety, right? Anxiety is a natural response. You should have anxiety over certain things. Like if you're cooking food, right? You want to have anxiety over the fact that you want your food not to be poisonous, right? So like meat eaters, I don't eat meat because I'm not a Nazi psychopath. But if you're a Nazi psychopath who eats meat, you're a freak show. You should probably stop eating meat. You're a fucking crazy person. That said, you should have anxiety over how long you've cooked your meat, right? Because you don't want to eat your meat and then get sick and die, right? So... A lot of anxiety, anxiety is a natural response. It's good. You should have anxiety about certain things, but you know, sometimes people's anxiety goes overblown. Like me, for example, I have an anxiety disorder. It fucks me up, right? So sometimes you need that helpful outside perspective. Um, psychedelic drugs can help people attain that outside perspective that they need to be able to determine what anxiety is real, what I need to be anxious about, and what is just my brain trying to convince me to have a bad time. And so, uh, you know, there you go. Pretty good. Uh, once again, I also want to talk about why, why are these drugs illegalized? Well, in the 1950s and 60s, scientists and researchers were using LSD and mushrooms uh, as a way to treat alcoholism. That's and to treat people uh, for cigarette addiction. But it was mainly alcoholism, and they had profoundly positive results. A majority of people in the 1950s and 60s studies that were treated with uh, LSD and mushrooms uh, for alcoholism, not only were they able to cure their alcoholism, but they said that the idea of drinking made them sick. Why? Because they always knew that it was a problem. The mushrooms or the LSD allowed them to see what the problem was from an outside perspective. See, yeah, getting drunk every day and beating my spouse or beating my kids or being a horrible family member, a horrible coworker, not good. And I had to break the cycle. And it allows people to see things from an outside perspective. But why were they banned? What happened? Oh, well, it's because of the blacks and the hippies. According to the Richard Nixon administration, the Controlled Substances Act of 1970 was specifically designed in a way to target 
the groups that would not vote for Republicans in elections, they said specifically that it was the blacks and the hippies that they were targeting the most. The anti-war movement, as well as just generally black people, not a huge fan of Republicans, typically. Uh, so what they did was they illegalized substances like LSD and mushrooms, as well as marijuana and other such things. Um, and so that's the reason why it was banned. It wasn't banned because, oh, people are going crazy. Whoa! Like the propaganda from the 1970s would want you to believe. Like the reefer madness garbage, right? People are doing LSD, man, and then they then they never came back. Uh, they lied to you. The whole reason why, in declassified documents that were shown, memos being tossed back and forth in the Richard Nixon administration, the only reason they targeted these drugs and not alcohol, white people like alcohol. Good, hard-working Americans like their beer. And so... What can we target that the black people like or that the hippies like? What can we target? Because they don't vote for us. How can we throw them in jail? And guess what happens when you go to jail? You lose your right to vote. So again, the science has always been in supportive of psychedelics for therapy. It's always been since the dawn of research. So the idea of it, we need it, like uh, people needing to walk on eggshells or do cautious research to find out what's going on and how these things affect the brain. It's purely propagandistic. We don't need to be doing cautious research. Now, should we be careful? Absolutely. We should do that just because it's the right thing to do scientifically. Um, it's just the right thing to do scientifically to be cautious with everything. But this idea that, Oh, if we make one bad decision, the brain's going to get fried. Ah! That's not going to happen. I mean, it could happen, I guess. Anything is possible, right? We could all spontaneously combust if, if it's possible, right? So factor this in. The science has always been in support of uh, psychedelic therapy. And uh, now it's just we're undoing the disastrous damage of the previous generation. Um, and, you know, it's about fucking time.